My guest at this time is Mark Mix. He's the president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. He joins me now to discuss the right to work and other labor-related issues as we approach Labor Day. And, Mark, thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure, Greg. Always glad to talk about this issue. Well, let's uh, have you bring our listeners up to speed because a lot of times when uh, organized labor is in the headlines, one of two things is happening. Either we're getting a Supreme Court ruling or a state is battling over whether or not to initiate right-to-work laws. So a little over a year ago, you and I spoke about the Supreme Court's Janus versus AFSCME decision, uh, which concluded that non-union members did not have to pay dues to public sector unions. Uh, organized labor said it would be cat- cataclysmic. Uh, you thought it would uh, hopefully be the first of a number of favorable decisions along the same logic. What's been the impact over the past 14 months here? Well, first and foremost, the uh, the good result of the Janus decision is that every government employee across the entire country has the right to decide whether or not they want to financially support a labor union. The Supreme Court ruled that uh, labor union activity in the government sector specifically is political in nature in that they are lobbying government for uh, the proper or improper allocation of resources, depending on how you look at it. And they deemed that to be political speech, and they said that's a violation of the First Amendment. So the good news is um, every worker in America that's employed by a government at the lowest levels to the highest levels is free to choose whether or not to financially support a labor union. That doesn't mean they can't support a labor union. That doesn't mean they can't participate in a labor union in any way they deem appropriate for them individually. Uh, But that Janus decision guaranteed that choice, and that's a real step forward. Uh, that is, in essence, a right-to-work law for the entire country for public sector workers, and that's good news. On the state legislative front and states trying to pass right-to-work, it's been an interesting year. Uh, we haven't had any new right-to-work laws, although we've had five new laws passed in the last seven years, uh, the last being Kentucky in 2017. There has been an effort, a significant effort, both in Nevada and now in Virginia, to try to overturn the state right-to-work laws that have been in existence in those states for decades. Um, we have successfully beat back uh, an attempt in uh, Nevada to repeal the right-to-work law in this last legislative session. And in Virginia, there is a lot left to be done. Uh, there will be elections for the uh, entire state. Senate and the entire House of Delegates here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and that probably will determine whether or not there's a a pretty big fight uh, next January over right to work here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Briefly go into that again. We've talked about it so many times, but uh, explain what right to work laws effectively do and what would happen if it got repealed. Yeah, in the 27 states that have right-to-work laws, basically those laws say that private sector workers, much like the Janus decision as it related to public sector workers, the right-to-work laws in the 27 states say that no private sector worker can be compelled to pay union dues or fees to get or keep a job. In the 23 states that don't have right to work, an individual worker can be fired from their job for simply failing to tender dues or fees to a labor union. That's an outrageous power that uh, union officials were granted way back in the 1930s. Uh, They parlayed that power very well into political power and financial power. Um, And the states that have passed these right to work laws, and really, Greg, they're that simple. They simply say that you have the right to participate in a union, but you cannot be compelled. And that's what right to work is all about. And and uh, in these states, in Virginia, if the legislature decides that they want to take up the repeal of right to work law, it would put Virginia in a position where workers here in the private sector, not in the public sector, because Janus rules that area now as it relates to the constitutional rights of government sector workers, but in the private sector, workers in Virginia could be fired from their jobs for failure to pay dues or fees to a labor union. So the stakes are high uh, for individual workers and for the state of Virginia, um, and, but we're certainly keeping an eye on it, that's for sure. Mark, uh, I know the main focus here is that you believe it's an individual freedom that these uh, workers ought to have as to whether or not they they join the unions and then pay the dues. But what's the impact, as far as you can tell, over the years, now that we've got 27 states that are doing this and 23 that aren't, uh, as you look at um, job opportunities for workers as well as the relative health of the economies of these states, which ones are doing better? Yeah, that's a great question, and the evidence is getting clearer and clearer all the time that the states that protect individual right to choose whether or not to financially support a labor union are doing better. Uh, Manufacturing and private sector job growth in the states that have right to work is dramatically higher than states that don't have uh, uh, the the protections of a right to work law, and that still allow forced unionism. I mean, you know, you have the the case studies of Illinois and New York and California and New Jersey, and, you know, you can ask politicians from those states, in fact, uh, 
in a rare moment of candor, I think it was the Senate Majority Leader in New Jersey the other day that said, our state's on fire. And he's a former union uh, union man and, well, I guess probably even a current union uh, uh, official that serves in the state legislature there. And he started talking about the uncontrolled expenses in the state, um, the pensions and the benefits for government workers there and how that state has been losing jobs, not creating jobs in New York State and Illinois have a net migration of people out of their states because there's no opportunity. So the right to work law guaranteeing individual freedom in the workplace, secondly, has a, the, the second impact is it is helping to create opportunities in those states. For example, in Kentucky, the last state to pass a right-to-work law in 2017. Uh, Governor Bevin down there, who was a a, a very strong advocate of right-to-work, indicated that their state over the last two years has basically had the best year ever in economic development, creating new opportunities and new jobs, attracting new industries to their state, and diversifying their economy from uh, a traditional mining economy and and a a couple of other rare uh, instances where, uh, you know, there's there's jobs there that are Kentucky-centric, but they now have gotten the steel industry interested in Kentucky. And and one company, uh, uh, an aluminum rolled steel company there, talks about how the right-to-work law was the primary factor for them taking and investing $1.3 billion in that state, creating high-paying new jobs in the manufacturing sector. So, with, with increased opportunity, um, increased private sector job growth, the right-to-work states are doing very well compared to uh, those that will not protect individual worker freedom. We're talking with Mark Mix. He's the president of the National Right-to-Work Legal Defense Foundation. And, Mark, before we get to the 2020 campaign, I want to get your thoughts on a story that was updated just this week. Uh, this is quoting from CBS News now. Federal agents on Wednesday descended on the homes of top officials with one of the nation's largest unions. FBI raids on the homes of Gary Jones, the current president of the United Auto Workers, and Dennis Williams, his immediate predecessor, signaled a dramatic escalation of a four-year probe into illegal payments to union officials. The corrupt the corruption investigation has so far led to the convictions of eight people linked to the UAW and to Fiat Chrysler involving bribes and kickbacks designed to influence the nation's sixth largest union's bargaining position at cr- contract talks with automakers. So uh, the case is still obviously unfolding here, although we do have some convictions, as the story from CBS pointed out. But when you hear allegations of illegal payments to union officials, um, I'm guessing it's not the first time you've heard that. What's usually involved with that? Yeah, this is really an unfortunate result of compulsory unionism. The idea that union officials are really unaccountable to rank and file workers because they can collect their dues and fees money as a condition of a worker's employment. So it, it makes it very difficult for rank and file workers to hold union officials accountable when they're compelled to pay. And it's not surprising. I, I think it was Senator McClellan back in the 1950s when the Congress addressed and passed the, the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act um, back when there was... Uh, real evidence of significant corruption in the union movement. And he said that uh, compulsion and corruption go together, that uh, through compulsion, union officials uh, have created an environment where this type of corruption can can occur. And unfortunately, it looks like this story in in Michigan with the UAW is not over yet. Uh, As you mentioned, there's already been convictions, and now they have raided the House and uh, the uh, former office and and a few other locations of the international president of the United Auto Workers and the past president of the International uh, Union of Auto Workers. It, it, it just it's a, a difficult story, and I feel bad for the the rank and file workers out there who not only voluntarily and uh, and, and encourage support for the unions, but those that at labor under the the union exclusive power that they have over them. That you know, as this story unfolds, they're probably going to find out that literally. Millions and millions and millions of dollars have been abused by leadership that really is unaccountable to the rank and file workers because of their ability to compel financial support. Mark, last topic. We're obviously, you mentioned the Virginia elections that are this year. Next year, of course, is the presidential race. I'm sure you've noticed a lot of people still running, even though a few have dropped out now. But uh, one thing I've noticed when it comes to organized labor is that you don't have a ton of allies running for the Democratic presidential nomination when it comes to right to work. And I'm guessing there are even fewer with a chance to actually win the nomination. So how prominent, I guess the question is, is the opposition to right to work on the left right now? In other words, if the Democrats win the White House and maybe even the Senate, how big of a priority is card check or or trying to roll back right to work going to be for the left? 
Well, you put that very, very nicely, Greg. Uh, the leading candidates, and I don't know how many are leading or how many are not leading, but I think every candidate that's announced to, to run for the nomination on the Democratic side of the aisle for the presidency of the United States – either has or will come out against right-to-work laws. In fact, the major ones, Sanders and Warren and Harris, and, and uh, they've all come out and said that if they were elected president, they would move and, and work very hard to repeal all of the right-to-work laws across the country. What they're saying and why they're saying it is, is really kind of an important uh, part of the discussion. The reason why they're saying it is because they're looking for the endorsement of the big labor union officials and the money that comes with that endorsement. Obviously, in the Democratic primary, one of the, the key prizes of that particular process is the endorsement of Richard Trumka of the AFL-CIO or, or Gary Jones of the United Auto Workers, although his endorsement may not be as valuable as it was a week or two ago. Um, but the bottom line is they're looking to, to be the shining example of, of union compulsion, so these union officials will invest and endorse them. Unfortunately, that endorsement of the rank and, you know, of the rank and file is something that is, has turned out to be something different than what the union officials officials have said that unions ought to do. And, and I think the current president is an example of that. Obviously, when winning states like Michigan and, o and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, uh, rank-and-file workers who are quote-unquote represented by union officials had something else on their mind when they went into the ballot box uh, back in 2016. So I think every single candidate out there running for the Democratic nomination has made it a point to say that they would work to repeal all the right-to-work laws in the country. And further than that, Greg, to your point, they would impose, they would try to impose card check unionization. That's the idea that you eliminate the secret ballot election for union certifications. We use that to elect our officials, and union officials use it to elect their officials, and Congress uses it to elect their leadership. But for rank and file workers, we don't want to let them vote by secret ballot anymore. We want them to be forced to sign a card or quote unquote convinced to sign a card that says they vote for a union. That system doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. They've tried it before, they've lost it. But those are the types of issues that they're pushing because it's over the plate for union officials. Not so much rank-and-file workers, but union officials. Mark, we'll leave it there. Have a happy Labor Day, and we'll talk to you soon as these issues unfold. Thanks very much. Thank you, Greg. As always, Mark Mix, president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. I'm Greg Corumbus, reporting for Radio America. And yes, all of you, please have a happy Labor Day weekend.